Jackie Shandu, political analyst, is our guest. And Butang Muilwa, a political analyst, joins us as well. Good evening to you, gentlemen, and thanks so much for joining us. Is this a little bit too late for Brian Mulefa? And I mean, I suppose it's something that he wanted to get off his chest. Where they have the opportunity or platform to do so uh, is another uh, a debate for another day. But do you think it's a little bit too late for him to come out and wanting to clear his name and also poking holes in the report? Well, good evening, Cindy, uh, J.K., and the N.S.V. viewers once more. I do not think it's late, Cindy. We always say there is the long arm of the law. You know, people like saying it in Africans, the long arm from the government, and also giving a fair opportunity. The case has not set down. The investigation, the inquiry into state capture hasn't set down. But also, you said it correct. Was Brian Molefe given a fair opportunity to can also say the side of his story. He was never given a fair opportunity, both by the media as well as the public protector's office. Now, fortunately, or to his advantage at the moment, the ANN 7 stood up and gave him a full interview to can explain some of the deficiencies <coughs> within the report. And he highlighted a number of things that some of us who critiqued that report actually to have been say it was rushed and it's unprofessional and it has a lot of discrepancies. He brought the light to some of the things, you know. Uh, I never paid attention to the fact that some dates in that report were written in what we will call the British format or South African format. And now when it covers some pages, especially towards Brian Molefe, it's written in, a, in, a, in an American format. So why would the public protector's office or writers use different date formats? But another element that I appreciate with Brian is that in making his statements and responding to the questions, he used the words, uh, allegations against him. So there are still allegations at the moment. He used the way that he observed how the public protector gave other people opportunity to come and res respond to the allegations, but he was never given an opportunity to do that. What happens to the Odi Atom Patem rule that we always talk about in the country to say you must be given a fair chance to can respond to allegations against you? And now he's even putting more holes to the report itself, you know, by saying, I was there five times, and why did the public protector even depart from his own sources of telephone records and say I was there 19 times? So once you lie in law or once you misrepresent information uh, that is under oath, everything else that you say after will be questionable. And that's where the catch is regarding the public protector's mm. report, particularly in this case towards the former CEO of, of, of ESCOM. Mm. And, and I mean, the simpler thing to do, I suppose, would be just to subpoena cell phone records, as Mr. Mm. Brian Mulefe alludes to, as to opposed to using a technology format that is not necessarily applicable. He, has, he says it's ineligible. You can't really read it. And we looked at the report. You can't make out whether it's really phone calls or it's a ping that puts you at a location uh, or whether it's you reading through your messages. He says some of the calls were mistaken uh, for his presence there while it was essentially him checking messages, for example. What, what does that tell you in terms of the new information that's now come out? What do you make out of it? Oh, <clears throat> good evening, Cindy, and good evening to the viewers of NN7. <laughs> I think we're also being far too generous to elevate that document into, into a report, you know, uh, that has any standing in law. Uh, and uh, we must also understand why it has not been used as a basis to approach the courts and uh, press charges. Because if indeed it met the standard in terms of the factual evidence, uh, the correctness of the information contained in it, of course, they, they would have been by now, certainly, uh, some sort of uh, advances towards uh, litigation. But uh, secondly, uh, it, it, it's just, it's disappointing at that level, you know, of the Office of the Public Protector, the kinds of errors, you know, uh, that now uh, uh, Brian Monifer is able to, to say, look, actually, this is not how it, 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 it went down, you know. So it, it, it tells you that, this indeed was a document that was rushed. Uh, it raises questions if there were not any political motivations behind the manner in which we have also seen, you know, some, some, some very clearly factual, sometimes even grammatical errors. You know, it's not something that you would associate with such a critical office in terms of uh, the democracy of this country. Yeah, but can he restore his previous reputation? And this is, of course, uh, based on what is playing out in the public discourse or the court of uh, opinion, etc., uh, of uh, his fall from grace, as it were. 
Well, Cindy, I, I think the damage has been done. You know, there's been personal attacks and criticism on the person of Brian Molefe as a human being. And the damage is done. Some of such things, you know, we live with them uh, in positions we go and we occupy. But uh, it cannot be reversed. What needs to happen and what may bail Brian Molefe and clear his name if the commission of inquiry to take place and all parties that were involved in this process must be brought to the table or to the book. Jackie has referred to a court of law that if this document had holding, they've been referred to a court of law. Let, it, let him be given a fair chance to go and explain himself and defend himself. And the story that Brian Molefe, as the CEO of ESCOM, was in sex world and he met with the Gupta family, that does not make you dirty at all. Let me make a few examples. As recent as two months back, the current Minister of Finance went to meet the CEO of First National Bank after the CEO of First National Bank stood up and said banks must boycott uh, South African Airways if the Minister of Finance is going to bail SAA out. Why is nobody making noise that a black political office bearer went to meet a white you know, racist, because he even used racist utterances of bailing SAA. Nobody's making noise about it, because why the Minister of Finance, who's holding the purse of the state, was meeting a white, you know, neoliberal capitalist, and everything is fine by doing that. During Mandela administration, we had Trevor Manuel himself, we had people like Pravin Gordon, Maria Ramos, and all others meeting with the private sector, engaging with them in doing business with them and companies that are doing business with government. Now, there is nothing wrong with that. If there's any wrongdoing in any process of government and tendering and contracts, let that be brought before a court of law. Yeah, and but if what brings that doing, kind of attitude towards or the hypocrisy in how we view, be it undue influence uh, or be it that uh, business has, has a way of controlling government and even informing policy. It speaks to the heart of white supremacy. And in this instance, white supremacy expresses itself in this hegemony when it comes to shaping public opinion. I mean, Botang raises a critical point that we speak of the Gupta family as if these are people who have been tried, convicted, and sentenced of any crime in this country. We've allowed this narrative to become so hegemonic that even though there is no charge led, there's no criminal charges, there's no case in court, these are stigmatized people. They are going to be stigmatized, they are demonized. And if you are seen in any way to be associated with them, you too become stigmatized. It, it, it's very sad in, in what is supposed to be a thriving democracy. It also speaks to the lack of plurality of views insofar as corporate media is concerned. We speak of a country where, with the exception of uh, this platform, public uh, opinion, information is disseminated through one source, which is the white monopoly, monopoly capital uh, platform. And this is what speaks. I mean, we are speaking today, people are rushing somewhere. There's this great book that is being launched that says all sorts of things. Again, we are not going to advance our interests as a black majority in this country. If we rely so much on, on, on news, on information cooked and disseminated with a very particular agenda by the same people that have been oppressing us, that have had nothing to do with our interests for so long, suddenly we must rely on them. When they say the Guptas are bad, we must follow suit. When they say mm -hmm. present, whoever it is. Yeah, and, a, and a thing with innuendos and um, assumptions and allegations and rumors is very difficult to prove your innocence because it is anecdotal so somebody you would look at that person's credibility and maybe they're standing in society or what have you if you look at the escom inquiry at the moment i think it's their suspended uh, legal uh, sure. person uh, suzanne daniels who, who, who deposed that well it, it is likely it may be likely that by may have influenced the to get a, a deal mm -hmm. and, and the prepayment so his work is really cut out for him it's not i think it emanates from the state of capture report and then there's other layers that have formed mm -hmm. uh, but well cindy uh, you know influence uh, in business is there whether it's from politics or in business once a political office being an occupant of a public office engages with a certain private company. Influence will be there either way in both directions. That's common cause in doing business. But but there is a perception, you know, perceptions in politics. 
have more meaning. They hold more water. People listen to perceptions Correct. more than facts. From the public prosecutor to everybody else, including the opposition party, they're talking of maybe suspected, and, and it's assumptions. None of them has taken a case. I want one company in the Republic of South Africa to take a case against the getter, go to a court of law, file a case, get these people charged, prosecuted, and convicted for any crime committed. Why is that not happening? We talk of influence as if since 1994 there has not been uh, political office bearers or public servants who have engaged business-wise with the private sector. As recent as Last year, the former Minister of Finance, Pravin Kodan, he used to have breakfast meetings with the business, addressing breakfast meetings. The current Minister of Finance is doing that. It has been happening that the business goes to Stellenbosch and it becomes a white boys club in Stellenbosch, hosting various politicians for a number of years, whether it's for breakfast, whether it's for dinner, whether it's funding political parties, including the ruling party, funding them and individuals who benefited there are so many individuals who were leaders of the ruling party, leaders of the Democratic Alliance, the opposition, who benefited from engaging, and I don't say it's corruption to engage, engaging with the private sector. They are now sitting in comfort zones. The former director general of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Bani Pichana, is sitting on a comfort zone in the chest chairperson of all Mushual and, and the Netco family. We look at people like Sakima Kozoma. They are in business. Are we saying they are corrupt? No, it does not mean they are corrupt. It means they've created opportunities themselves for themselves when they were occupying public service positions and they left the public service to go and pursue business. Cyril Ramaphosa, the deputy president of the country himself, he didn't start as a business person. He was a unionist, the leader of the ANC. He's in business. Are we going to say he's corrupt? No, we shouldn't say that. He created an opportunity and when it presented itself, he grabbed the opportunity. We should look at this whole thing holistically. Yeah, but is the approach now with Brian Mulef, I, mean, I don't know what, he, what else he has at his disposal or his um, arsenal in, in terms of getting to the bottom of these particular uh, allegations. As he says, uh, they're not factual and the fact that it's, you can't even read or make out what the, the diagram is all about, there's disparaging remarks that are made against him. Is this the right approach in your view? I think he should consider uh, the courts, you know, uh, to, to say, look, uh, my image has been tarnished, I've been defamed in this way. Uh, something that has been unprovoked and, and, and yeah I, I think that's when he will really get some traction even in terms of how the public responds you know uh, it's unfortunate that uh, it's taken this long you know because we're talking about over a year in terms of when these allegations were first made uh, it, it, it would have certainly you know gotten more public interest had it happened you know, just a, f a few weeks yeah. after the And what compels the erstwhile public protector to respond to these uh, questions that uh, Mr. Malefe demands answers to? Well, I, I, I think as a citizen of the country, as an individual who has a legal standing, he is, you know, the public protector's office and not the individual is compelled to respond to those questions. Failing to do so, no matter how long uh, Jackie he has, uh, he has taken to can approach the court, it's within a year he may have been studying the report, he may have been consulting for legal advice. He still has an opportunity to approach the court as a civilian, to go to a civil court and say, my personality or my person has been defamed. I've been uh, attacked through lies and misconceptions, and I, ne I need my name to be cleared. He has that opportunity. I don't think it's late for him to can do that. And I think, actually, looking at the whole picture now, he did the right thing by keeping quiet and studying the information and let every noise maker make noise and allegations because sometimes when people do such allegations they put aces on your table they give you facts they say things that were not intended to be said which gives an opportunity to can go and say okay this is what they are thinking let me build my case so brian may have sat down kept silent while he was building his civil case to can now challenge the public protector's office and say, can you prove your allegations in order to clear my name? He has that opportunity. Mm. But how, how, where did it all begin to tumble in the sense that if you look at uh, public... Uh, uh, Minister of Public Enterprises, Lynn Brown, firstly with the whole debacle about the, uh, his pension, whether he's a full-time uh, employee or contractor, whatnot, you know, the back and forth, him being a minister and you blink and he's no longer a minister. How does all of that play into the mammoth task that he has in trying to at least come up for a breath and, and, and for, for, for somebody to listen? Uh, that, that was tragicomical. It was a circus. It was a tragedy at the same time. Uh, without any sort of uh, substantive 
uh, uh, positions coming, either from ESCOM or from himself. And of course now, having been associated with that drama, you know, it sort of trivializes even his person. And this is a, a highly accomplished uh, technocrat and executive who had a sterling performance and tenure at the Pu Public Investment Corporation. So he comes to ESCOM with these very transnet unmatched, yeah. unmatched credentials, mm. you know, with a, a decent track record. And uh, this drama at ESCOM that is now seen embroiled in, and these are uncertainties about whether he's employed on a full-time basis, he's resigning or he's not, unfortunately, have not inspired public confidence. But we do know, we do know, let us not forget, ESCOM, Transnet, SAA, the vast number of, of state-owned uh, enterprises in this country. We do know the Cold War that is happening with the old guard, the, 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 the white section of capital that wants to maintain the status quo. And anyone who seems to be pushing for transformation, we've seen even with the former SAA chairperson, uh, uh, how much she came under fire. We do know that uh, Brian Molefe has been a champion of transformation where, where, everywhere he has been. And unfortunately, we are talking about a, a white monopoly capital block in this country that is so powerful, not only in terms of even managing some ministers and politicians and members of parliament, but even in terms of, you know, of, of the media. And, and, and unfortunately, as Botsang cor correctly points out, in politics, perception sometimes has far more currency than reality. And sometimes people are not even interested in the facts. If we're interested in the facts, we would be outraged even today that if you speak of the construction sector, you speak of the uh, law profession, you speak of the food retail market, you are speaking about oligarchs, big four, big five, big four, big five, who dominate almost 100% of those markets. There is no outrage, even though Status A has said not long ago, 30 million South Africans survive below the poverty line. I mean, that, for me, that should have shut the country down up until serious mm. alternatives were taken into place. But since we don't care about facts, since we are not scientific, since... Uh, the white monopoly capital knows that it is dealing mainly with a politically illiterate black majority. It can just manipulate, hoodwink, misrepresent, falsify, and it is able... So in this murky waters, we come back again sure. to Mr. Brian Mulefe and just his demeanor, uh, seeing him the other day, you, you can tell he's taken a lot of strain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we wish him all the best and, and courage, etc. But it's going to have to be a legal route because in the space where we're in now, and we, we hope he's got the finances and the, the, the means to do so. Uh, but, um, because that in itself can be another lengthy, cumbersome exercise that could potentially break him further. Well, well Cindy, you know, the, the worst thing you can do in, in life as a normal employee who earns a salary is to try and fight your employer. They've got the capital or to try and fight the white media. And, and white capital. And, and that's the worst thing you can do because they will drain your resources and finances to an extent that you, you will be bankrupt at the end of the day. But for justice, and, 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 and I'm saying Brian should rise, you know, uh, 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 he should rise and face this elephant in front of him to clear his name. Jake has talked about Brian's credentials and what he has done. Uh, if it was me, I would do it by all costs necessary. I will use every cent under the sun to can take up this issue, especially the public protector's office. This may be sure. The public protector's office may go and reopen this matter, relook at the facts, relook at the records, and it may not drag to court to clear his name if he is being treated fairly. I spoke about fair treatment at the beginning. But I think uh, this country is supposed to be a democratic country. I think he should be given a fair chance, like all other people have been given a fair chance, for his questions to be responded to. The public protector's office sends questions to people who responds to them. Therefore, if they are also being asked questions, they should be in a position to can, to can respond to it. If they don't, then you must take them to the cleaners. So you say that the author, and in this case, uh, former public protector Tulima Donzella, can wash her hands off that her job has been done and that the onus now lies with the advocate in Quebec. And unfortunately, uh, uh, that's how democracy and systems work. No, if you look at ministers, a minister commits <laughs> an error today, he or she leaves the office, the new minister faces the music, that's how it works. Sure. However, the office of the public protector and the courts of law, they may be in a position 
to so can call in Miss Madon Zella and say, can you come and clear and explain this kind of situation? But in this instance, we shouldn't, <laughs> as a nation, personalize this sure. kind of, of report. This is a public protector's report. It's compiled by the Office of the Public Protector. If there are any personal questions, like it's happening with the SED many case at the moment, whereby an inquiry or a court may think a certain individual has to answer a certain question, yeah. then she will have to be called in. Yeah. Look, I mean, uh, Brian has been in the trenches. It's not necessarily about him. It's about what he represents politically. It's about his commitment to seeing South Africa change from being just a modern day colony, you know, uh, more than 20 years into democracy. And that anyone who then takes that position to say, I am going to use my position, my influence, my leadership at whatever level to advance the interest of radical economic transformation and the economic liberation of black people will come under attack, as we see here. Okay. But we want to say it's time now that the economic war is, t is taken back to, 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 to the white minority. They need to be on the defensive too, you know? Okay, we're going to leave it there, uh, Jackie Shandu and Butang Mwilwa. As always, your insights are appreciated. And uh, they're both political analysts speaking on uh, Brian Malefa taking on uh, the uh, public protector's report on the state of capture. Thanks for watching. Up next are the latest weather update. Do stay with us.